Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe, the host and producer of the chats with Mistress Joanne Gaddy. The Fireside Chats are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum in Chicago. Today, I have the honor of being able to speak with Sybil Holiday in San Francisco. Sybil is proudly a former hippie. She's a former burlesque performer, a community educator, and a hypnotist. So, welcome, Sybil Holiday, to Inside Leather History. Thank you. It's a delight to be here today. I'm glad. Let's start right at the very beginning. You, when we were preparing for this interview, you told me that your motivation comes from your heart. Correct. What do you mean by that? You asked me where I, where I was from, and I immediately said my heart. You meant where I started as a child, but my heart has always served me well. My foundation is my spirituality. I didn't know that when I was little, although I fell in love with the moon when I was three. Um, I just knew that the best way to proceed in life was to be with my heart. And my heart never lied. My heart didn't, my pussy. <laughs> <laughs> my pussy lied. <laughs> ah, yes, we got those confused a couple of times. But my heart, if it served me well, it has served me so well. I have had news just a couple of days ago that my heart was right. And other people around me were like, mm, what are you doing? And I'm like, hmm, following my heart. I didn't think that at the time. I just knew that I was doing the right thing. But you, you also said here that the moon is your guide. When I was three years old, my mother had to rescue me. I don't remember this, she told me. Uh, because I was leaning and reaching for the upper window to look at the full moon. Now, it's not unusual for a three-year-old child to be entranced by a big silver disc in the sky. Mm -hmm. However, it didn't stop, you see. The moon um, was such an influence on my life. She, it's steady. We see the same moon all the time. All of us have always seen this moon, wherever you are on the planet. And from the beginning that there were beings, the moon has been there. It's a constant. And it is beautiful. And it's mysterious. We only know one side of it, really. I mean, yeah, little little rovers have done their thing, but, you know, what we see is what we see. And when I got older, I started learning about alternative spiritualities. My mother believe, my mother didn't believe in anything. My mother thought that I, however, that I should be educated. And when we moved to Boston from my grandparents' farm, she took me to every church, temple, synagogue, meeting house, you name it, we went there. Holy Rollers, Seventh-day Adventists, anywhere that we could get in, we went. Wow. And none of them were mine. <laughs> none of them. I wound up, uh, you know, you're, you're taught a prayer, um, or uh, some of us are taught a prayer. Um, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Okay, so I would say that little prayer, and then, you know, mom would leave, and then I'd say another prayer, which went like this. Oh, dear Jesus, you know you're not the one for me. <laughs> <laughs> what was the point of going to all of these houses of worship? So that I could make up my own mind. Oh, I see. She knew she didn't believe in anything, but my mom, the, she didn't know the word dysfunctional, but she knew there was something wrong with the way she wasn't abusive they were just very victorian my grandparents oh. and my father left and she knew there was something wrong so she believed highly in education and i have an excellent east coast education because of that and i she taught me how to read i remember sitting on her lap and just her her finger going and underneath the words and I remember my first book that I remember one page 
and it said bat, cat, hat, and it had a picture of a, a baseball bat, a cat, and a man's hat. And I remember that page. And I was reading, kind of, by the two and a half. Oh, wow. I was reading very early. Um, and that was her whole thing. I, she used flashcards for fun. She was way into education, educating me. The first time I told her that I wanted to go to therapy, she said, why? You're not crazy. And I said, no, I'm not, Mom. But I, I, there are some things I can't quite figure out by myself, and I, I need some help on that. And she said, I raised you to think. And I said, right, I know. And I thought, my, I'm thinking my way to a good therapist. <laughs> and that's kind of been my approach. My approach has been very logical and very spiritual to life. I'm highly spiritual or deeply spiritual, highly skeptical, however you want to look at it. I'm very pragmatic, you see. Um, Before we go down that road, though, let's take one step back. You mentioned you were from Massachusetts, Boston. Yeah. East Hampton is where I was raised on my grandfather's grandparents' turkey and, and vegetable farm, 18 acres of land for the first five years, and I'm so glad. And then we moved to Boston. Uh, we lived, uh, it was, we were poor. Mom uh, went on, on welfare because she got chased around the desk. This is before there was any HR, you know? And she didn't want to do that. And um, then uh, she got a job and, you know, I got bullied. <laughs> I, I, this, the person you see here, not bad. But when I was uh, eight years old, I, I blew up in every direction. I got fat. I was very tall. I was smart. I had thick glasses. I had a full body rash. I had this hair when this was not in style. Cher was in style. And my mother dressed me funny. <laughs> on, top of, on top of everything else. Bless her heart. She sewed. And, um, but she was of the generation when little when children look like little adults and so she dressed me funny and i looked like a little adult when everybody else in 1955 i was five but 1958 they were not dressing as little adults but i was 12 years old i got beaten up for it mm. and i told her i'm not going i'm not going anywhere until you let me pick my home clothes wow. and uh, by 12 years old i was five foot eight and I weighed 180 pounds. I was a huge kid. My mom was huge, too. You see, all the women were big. Nobody thought anything about it. They were all great cooks off the farm. I had a rough childhood. Not, not, uh, I wasn't abused by my mom. My mom loved me. Um, but the peers, um, were ter that was bad. And so when I, at 17, shared my virginity. I didn't lose anything, but I did share something. Um, I, it was very interesting. I went from a kid to a woman. Uh. I had this experience that, oh, this is fun. I like it. Sex is good. How does pragmatism uh, work into that? <laughs> Um, I would go to the edge, and then I'd find out where the edge was, and then I'd push it a little bit, and then I go. Mm. My, I, I will backtrack a little bit. My, when I, when I was 18, I read Heinlein's um, uh, *The Martian*, and it's a beautiful book. And I read *The Harrod Experiment*, which is all about free love and carrying on. And and you know, people ask me what what formed my life, and I said, well. Those. <laughs> it's 1967 and 1968. If you want to have a good time and break out of being a wallflower, take acid in 1967. Share your virginity and party because that's what I did. Well, how were you introduced to acid? A stranger gave me a hit of Audley. <laughs> it was Boston, uh, the Boston Commons. And I lived close to that. And I was already a baby beatnik. And so just sliding into being a hippie wasn't that unusual. And I lived on uh, Beacon Hill, the wrong side. But where I lived, it was very multicultural. 
and I could just walk down there and walk to Cayman Street and then walk to Charles Street and then there was the Collins. And so I read, I'd read about all of this and I thought, hmm, I wonder. And I was reading about what was happening in New York. They were having B-ins and I'd smoked marijuana when I was 13. Wow. You know, the street I lived on now, this wasn't true of all the streets on, on the wrong side of Beacon Hill. Now it's very nice, by the way. Now the street, I had somebody take a picture and they said, Oh, Mistress Sybil, you grew up in such a beautiful street. And I went like, what? Uh, changed what? a lot over time. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was all right, but we were all poor on that street. And the building that I lived in, there were 10 gypsies crammed into a one-bedroom apartment on the first floor. Oh my gosh. Okay? <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't say gypsies, but that's what... That's what it was called then, Romani, Roma. Um, yeah. But there were, there were, hold on, there were beatniks. There were gay men. There were professors. There was a delightful Jewish family that lived right up the street. There was um, Margarita who hung out the corner and greeted everybody all day long. It was a fun street. So when I got bullied in school, I hated school. I hated my legal name. Uh, but outside of that, I had a little light. And I read like crazy. I read, read, read. And mom sent me to good schools, about which I'm so grateful. Well, tell us about the beginning this hitchhiking journey that took you to New York and then San Francisco. Eventually, um, yes, eventually, um, I, I went with friends, we were going <laughs> to, we were just going to go to New York, so we hitchhiked to New York, my good friend and I, we stayed in New York for a month and something, a little bit more than a month, and so the reason I left New York, I was going to be in prison or dead, I didn't like who I was becoming. I had a, a what they call it, a, my own personal come to Jesus moment. Well, I left. And um, I wound up here. Three days later, hitchhiking. I got 60 miles about outside of New York on the freeway <laughs> and thinking, I can't do it this way. What? And along came a Volkswagen bus. My friends, three days earlier, had said that we're going to San Francisco. You want to come? And I said, no. There they were. They had stopped off, picked up another bus. And three days later, I'm in San Francisco. But arriving in San Francisco at that time, Ooh, honey. and the stuff of legends, what did you encounter when you got to San Francisco? Then? Well, I had four friends to my name. Um, I had a purse that was functioned like a backpack, kind of. I got a room at a crash pad that night, and I wound up <laughs> flirting with heroin, but it's not my thing. I got very sick about two weeks later because it's not my thing. And then I moved to North Beach <laughs> because what was happening in the hate was not as good as it had been. 1966-67 and the hate were fine. 67 in Boston was fine. But speed and then heroin was coming into the hay. Oh. And so when I got here, um, in North Beach, I hit, I panhandled for a while. People were doing that like crazy. And I would go down into tourist areas and, and you know, look all sweet and pathetic and hit up couples for, do you have a quarter so I could get something to eat? And the woman would go, oh, Fred, give her a dollar. She could be little Mary at home. It was great. So I got a, a room at the Intella Hotel, which is now an Airbnb. Wow. Yeah, it was a really good hotel, and then it became a hippie hotel, and now it's an Airbnb. Thing is, you know, you never know, right? You never know. But you mentioned you met uh, Janis Joplin there. Yes, yes, that was in North Beach. 
Janis Joplin, oh my. What happened was that I, living in the Atella, my boyfriend, Janos Bidiachi, was one of Janice's first guitar players. Before, before she was uh, with the holding company, before it was Pearl, before all of that, before, before, before. And so he knew her, and her roommate at the time was a, the bartender and waitress at the saloon on Grand Avenue. And they had a ho, uh, not a hoedown, um, open mic, uh, and you could sing along, and you know, in the other room. So I would go there, and I would hang out. And I, Speedy, I actually lived in the same hotel. And then one day he said, "I want you to meet somebody. Let's just go play." And so that's how I met Janice. And he would play guitar, and she would sing, and I can't. Re I wish I could harmonize, but I can't. <laughs> but um, and so it, this was just everything. It was 1968 to just before. What were your thoughts when she made it really big? I was happy for her. Um, she deserved it. She is unique. Uh, she had such soul. She was so raw. So raw. And, but I wasn't surprised when she died. Why not? No. I was deeply saddened, deeply, deeply saddened, that I wasn't surprised. Well, why not surprised? Well, people used her, you know. You become famous like that, you can't help it. There are, there are people who will latch on, um, and they want, and they just want your name, and they want to be say they know you, and they want to use you. I am this, this bit, this bit <laughs> famous. And I have that still. I mean, there are people who say they know me. They've never met me. Oh, They've never okay. been in a class, but they see me somewhere. But coming back to the, the situation in San Francisco, at that time, San Francisco would have been sort of a mecca for everybody, everyone. And it, was, it would have been an amazing time to have been there. Tell us a little bit about the San Francisco you knew, late 60s, going into the 70s. I lived at the Intella, as I said, which was a short walk to Broadway. It was uh, very close to Lombard Street. And I was a hippie. Uh, I had left the bikers behind. I was no longer a biker hippie chick. I was done with that. And uh, I had my colors, I burned them, I was done. Done, 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 so done, done. And so panhandling would take me to Broadway. Panhandling would take me all around the city. And the city was very vibrant at the time. The music scene was happening everywhere. There were, this hotel was crammed full of hippies and musicians. So you could go in that hotel and you'd hear music. There were people playing on the street. There you go to, it just, everything that you have seen is true. Everything that you might even fantasize about, it was a fairy land, really. Wow. And, and the sexual freedom, the pill. Women could have sex and not worry about getting pregnant. And only had, all we had to worry about later on was herpes, and nobody was worried, didn't realize how bad herpes could be. So we, we you know, and so you got a shot if you got the clap, woo! It was very free and very loose, and for me, one thing I wanted to do, and I got to do it, was be a stripper. Tell us about being a stripper. How was it for you? Great. I, great. Um, this shy, uh, too fat, too tall, got a rash, mom dressed her funny. That's just like a, a bad coat that was put on me. That's not who I am at all. I am a woman, a human, that enjoys life to the max. I'm not the most beautiful person, but I'm not ugly. And... I did take ballet, and I have a certain innate grace. And the first place I, what, how it happened was I was sitting in the lounge 
in the hippie hotel smoking a joint with everybody else. And the barker from this small, itty-bitty nightclub way down at the end of Broadway, just near the freeway, comes in and says, we only have one dancer. We need two more. Does anybody, is anybody here a dancer? Does anybody want to work tonight? And I went, I do. <laughs> so I borrowed some clothes. I borrowed a pair of heels that were too small, God help me. Um, I had makeup. And I did my best hippie finery makeup care. I put a thing here. I did something with this. Um, I showed up. All, all's Broadway Inn. A-L-L Broadway Inn. It had been just a bar. But he was cashing in. So he threw up a bench against the wall. The smallest cocktail tables you could imagine. The smallest itty bitty bitty cocktail uh, uh, chair. Uh, built a stage at the end in between the men's room and the ladies room <laughs> and that's where I started go-go dance it was go-go dancing and there was a oh, they were both and um, so at the end of that he said you got a job if you want it and I said yeah I said bring me ID I was 19 uh. okay next day I got and I got 25 bucks Twenty-five. That was a lot of money for then. To just, as far as I was concerned, having a good time taking off my clothes, right? And uh, I was low woman on the totem pole, so uh, I got the leftover songs. Uh, there were three of us that night. There were three of us. Two, uh, two were, had been working, and and I was the third. And they taught me what to do, and we rotated. One danced, one sat with customers, one was the waitress. On and on and on. 20 minutes on, 40 minutes off. Oh, I see. I see. We would hustle the customer for quarters for the jukebox, except we had, um, what do you call them, tokens. Okay. So we kept all the quarters. <laughs> well, you're talking a very mini hustle here. Uh, and it was uh, bee drinking. So you'd get the, the guy to buy you a drink and... There was very little alcohol in it, and to sit with you, okay. you got a kickback for that. So along with your twenty-five bucks, you got that, and um, that's where I started. And I had a great time. I danced to songs nobody wanted to dance to. I didn't care. Such as? Oh well, nobody wanted to dance to um, "Jumpin' Jack Flash," which is a great song. I do not. Why I didn't want to dance to that? Susie Q is also a great song. Um, uh, the Pusher. Nobody was going to dance to that either. And I did. Oh, what else? I can't really remember all of them, but but um, I didn't care. They had a good beat, you see. So, How did it progress for you? Well, I first bought a pair of shoes that fit me right. And I got phony ID. And that worked. And I danced there for a few months. A few months. And then I was just, you know, I thought, I want to I wanna go up the street. I want to start developing this. I was the most overdressed go-go dancer, by the way. <laughs> because go-go dancing was boring. I mean, you danced your ass off, for one thing. And, boy, did I hurt that night. Uh. Oh, I hurt where I had didn't know I had muscles. I had no idea. So, okay, the next day I was pacing myself. Um, but it was weird. You'd dance, and then on the break, little minute break, in between the songs, you'd take off something. That makes no sense to me. Taking something off is part of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Why are you just like, no sense. So, I started adding things. Okay. I started stripping. And I thought, this is really what I want to do. Finally, somebody said to me, you're not a go-go dancer, you're a stripper. You really should go somewhere where they strip. But I, I felt I didn't know enough, really. So, I, I, I went up on Broadway, you know, and I watched them there. I thought, not ready. But then, somebody mentioned the Chez Paris. 
And Chez Paris is on 150 Mason Street. And it had a big pink and neon can-can leg outside. It had been a real nightclub with a band, singers, perform all kinds of stuff. Um, and uh, Meyer Nepp owned it with his wife, who uh, was Japanese, and um, a diva. She was carrying the little purse dog back then. And she was a stripper on, that was a ballerina. Oh. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And boy, was she the iron fist in the velvet glove. But she stayed up on Broadway with the, with the good girls, you know. And, and we down there were the girls who didn't quite have it, were too old, whatever. Or just didn't want to deal. Didn't want to deal with her. <laughs> um, and I worked in the daytime. Okay. Well, I got to tell you, working from 12 to 8 in the daytime at the Chez Paris, where sometimes there was no one until 2, I got to practice. I got to be up to two girls on, three girls on. I got to practice and practice and practice and practice. I got to watch strippers with experience. Tell us about moving on to burlesque. Well, that, you know, that was working um, at the Follies. So I got a very good education at the Shapery. And eventually I started working nights. And that's when I really got an education. I worked with somebody called Tori Lynn, who, if she hadn't been black, would have been a big star. She really knew Afro dancing, modern jazz, and ballet, and oh, and I just I would I would be cocktail waitress saying, and I forget to cocktail waitress. I'd be there with my tray just and. A lot of what I she would, would come out a lady would get down, and then back up and be a lady again. And I thought, yeah, yes, yeah, so that's it. So I started, and she oh, and I have to tell you, baby doll. I have to tell you about baby doll because baby doll taught me how to walk. I didn't know. How to walk. Baby doll was the bartender um, and the manager in the daytime, and she was relatively petite. She was about five five, but she'd wear sky high heels and sky high hair and, <laughs> and was built like whoa i mean built and accentuated it and i didn't know how to walk at the time i had this little like side thing and i, I really hadn't figured out how to walk that walking is a dance move several i hadn't put that together but i was still dancing she said, "Come watch me." And I'm like, "Okay, where are we? We're leaving the we're leaving the bar. What? Why are we leaving the bar?" She goes, "Watch." She was billed as Baby Doll, the girls who stops traffic. Oh boy. So, we get to Market Street and the traffic's going zing zing, right? Without looking, she, and not on a crosswalk, she just starts walking slowly. And everything is moving, and she is fucking as she's walking. But she's just walking. Traffic stopped, and they didn't start up again. That's what is so interesting. They, I mean, they can't, she just started walking. It was slow, but cars would go. Ah! But then, you know, cars over here and cars over here were like, what? What's going on? And then they, she'd get past these cars and they would move. Why? Because everybody's glued walking, watching this one. Yeah. Defying traffic. The power of a woman walking. Think about that. How lucrative was burlesque for you? Burlesque at the time was fading. Um, what happened was I was working at the Shea and I learned about 15, uh, 16 Street Follies. And I thought, oh, theater, whoa, with the live drummer, right, and an organ player, and um, a comedian, and an opening, and a closing, and a little bit. That, and that was what I really wanted to do. It sounds like real fun. So um, I took my best outfits. I went to the manager. Uh, <laughs> he just asked me to take off my clothes. 
no problem. I mean, he didn't ask me to strip, just wanted to see my body. I wanted to know my name. And he said, sure, uh, in two weeks. That was fine. Okay. But it's only a week, you see. Because girls would come through. That's the way theater is. It turned over. Now, this place had a very weird, very weird thing. The manager thought that if you changed your name, your wig, and your act, the audience wouldn't notice. Of course they did. The white men didn't know that this was the, from the manager, and the white men thought we were all nuts. Because the strippers who came through, you see, on an agency, didn't do that. But the local ones, us, we did that. And they thought, what is going on with you? Are you all multiple personality? What? So I had four that I rotated. There was Senkinda, who was, which was my own hair, which was bright red at the time. And it was a hippie chick with all kinds of flowing stuff. And um, here comes the sun, and you know, like that. Okay? Uh, I was um, Tina St. John, who was, and I danced a Mac the Knife. And I had a pair of cheap, cheap over the knee he, uh, boots. And it was, it was pretty, it was SM without being SM. You know, it was sharp, I had a black wig. It was very different than Holiday O'Hara, at the time Holiday Hart, who was the blonde bombshell. And, um, oh, and Dusty Raven. And Dusty Raven was um, brown hair and um, just a little, not holiday, not glamorous, but more slinky. <laughs> so we had these four different things. And I would rotate them. And so I do, the, you do the same act, you see, for the whole week. Four shows, you do the same act. So, okay, well, the next month, I could have a different act for all of those three, four people. Well, I got to work. <laughs> there. Then I met Holly Hills. And Holly Hills said, you want to go on the road? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I want to go on the road. What's that mean? Sounds like fun again. So she introduced me to Jess Smack. And she said, you need pictures? You need a little bio? Oh, got pictures? Made a little bio? Said, oh, Jess Mack. Jess Mack sent me to Guam. Oh, wow. wow. And, and I went twice. I loved Guam. Yeah, I have been there. Oh, it's awful now. Now it's all neon and, and hustle, cheap hustle. Uh, but then they had strippers, good strippers. They, uh, they, everything was very um, culture segregated. Not segregated in a bad way, but like the Filipina girls didn't strip. Oh. They were the waitresses, as were the Vietnamese later on. But the um, Filipina bands were awesome. They hardly spoke any English. They were adorable. But, and you ought to hear in Agaravita when you don't speak English. But they could play. Um, the Japanese had the big hotels, like the Hilton and all that. And then there was Chinese food and there was Vietnamese. I love Asian food. And there was, oh God, the food was heaven. Um, and the water was beautiful, beautiful, and clean, so clean. It says you studied basic to advanced sexuality, AIDS education, at the Institute for Advanced Study of Human Sexuality. Right. Tell us about that. That was a lot of fun, too. After a while, dancing and traveling, and being with women, and doing my, with my thing, which is wind up talking and listening, and going, hmm, have you ever thought about? Um, I was back in San Francisco. I had had a great time traveling. I needed to do something else, though. And when did I first do that? I don't remember. That's a big leap, you see. So 77, last time I was in Guam. 
Then what happened? Whoa. Um, 78, 79. Dancing on Broadway. More dancing on Broadway. We're dancing at um, the 16th Street, doing that back and forth, back and forth. Um, but now really dancing on Broadway. Not, I, there was a time when I did the amateur contest on Broadway. I never won. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't weird enough. There was this really fat girl who was adorable. And she wore an angel, angel dress and she just pulled down her shirts and she could really dance. She had a beautiful face. There was this other woman who was flat as a board but could dance. And there was this other woman who was funny as fuck, beautiful, and said she was um, Grace and she was a lay teacher. And then there was me. And I would be Sinkinda, a hippie. I never won because I wasn't weird enough. It was, it was all a rig anyway. We were sitting in the audience, but it was just funny. I thought that was funny. Anyway, um, when did I start? Oh, okay. So... Actually, I got kinky first. <laughs> in 1976, see, I didn't do the Institute. But what happened was, in 1976, I was dancing at the Chez Parade, okay? And I met Cleo Dubois. For the benefit of the audience, please tell us who she is. Ah, uh, Cleo Dubois, well, <laughs> who she is? Cleo Dubois, in her own right, is a ritualist, an SM educator, the creator of the Cleo Dubois Intensives. She is my dearest heart sister. I've known her since 1976. We lived together from 76 to 80, I, gosh, 80 something. She moved across the street, opened up her own little dungeon there. We worked together. And she ultimately married Fakir Musafar. Yes. So, yes, she was my girlfriend. And she was a dancer. She was a belly dancer is how we met. She was a belly dancer. I was a stripper at the Shapery. She wanted to learn stripper moves, and I wanted to learn belly dance moves because I wanted to create a I Dream of Genie act. So we went into our apartment and traded over on uh, Leppage and traded dance moves. What about her work? Tell us about the work she was doing and how you were called to that. When she said that she wanted to put ring bolts in the wall of her entire her bedroom, which is entirely wood paneled in the wood shows, beautiful Edwardian home, I said, what? <laughs> no, you can't ruin the woodwork. What, why do you want to put? So my boyfriend can tie me up and spank me. What? <laughs> what? What? Oh my God, what did, I, what did I let move into my home? Where did that lead? She also was going to the Society of Janus, which is the second oldest SM educational and social group in the United States. And so she came to me and about a week later, and I'm, I'm thinking, how I, I need a new roommate. I got to kick her out. I got to kick her boyfriend out who's in the other room. Oh, wow. And, you know, he was fine. He was, he was, he kept to himself. So, I'm very upset, actually, because all I know, you see, is from that awful porn. And either in that awful porn, the boss uh, spanks his uh, secretary because she's been bad, the hell, or um, the burglar, this is my favorite, the burglar breaks into the home, the wife catches him, Hits him over the head with a rolling pin, ties him up, and then gives him a blowjob. What? Wait, what? That was my favorite. So that's all I knew. I was like, you know. <laughs> I, I, I'm an experimental person, but no. So I said no. <laughs> and then she said to me these amazing words. She said, SM is not what you think it is. It isn't? What do you mean? Please go to a meeting, to an orientation of the Society of Janus, and just listen. You can, you don't have to join, but please go, please. What did you learn though, going to the Society of Janus? The SM is not what I thought it was. What did you learn that it was? Well, you know, I met these people. I just met people like you and me, 
I met an accountant, a sweet little old man whose thing was just shoes. He just wanted, and submissive, but he just wanted to be down there under your shoe. Okay. I met somebody who just wanted to be spanked and was really very hesitant about saying the word spank. I met all these people. I met an accountant. I met a cab driver. I met a teacher. You know, I met, I met humans. Is what happened. It all became not porn. It became real. It became humans. It became people talking about things that were beyond my knowledge but really trying to figure stuff out. And you say, that's where I'm from. You know, my heart and, and my deep curiosity about what's real in this world, what, what's this about? The porn that I saw, were, the, the submissive was a groveling worm with no self-respect. And the woman was just abusing him. And I love men. And that was so 180 degrees for me that I'm like, no. So what did you learn that you found desirable? Ah. Well, at first, not a lot. What I found desirable, so I started, I joined, and I started figuring things out. And I went to every meeting because I realized very quickly that I don't know anything. I thought I did. Oops, wrong. So I went to meetings on piercing. I didn't have any interest in piercing, but I went to meetings on it because I was intrigued. I went to meetings on bondage. I didn't have any interest in bondage. I went to meetings on various things and I also started listening more to people and talking about various things somewhere in there and I can't remember when oh phone sex that's it there we go so um, in 1983 I stopped working at the Sutter and I uh, not the Sutter yeah I, I became manager at the Sutter uh, theater and I was dancing there and then after Guam uh, I became, I started being, I was everybody's relief girl at the Sutter Theater, and then I became manager. So, okay, I started my, I started working doing phone sex, and I developed my own phone sex line, and that is where I came across infantilism. I never heard of it. But interestingly, I got turned on by just being a very kind mommy to this baby boy. That's all, and I thought, this is so sweet. It was really sweet, huh? I didn't know that 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 this existed. Then I heard about the Institute of Advanced Sexuality. I thought I and they had this um uh, no. Then I did Swissy. I did San Francisco Sex Information, and I got on their hotline. Okay, once a week answering questions about sex. Then I thought. Uh, I need to know more, so I went, did the institute, and I became um, a certified sex educator, and then an advanced certified, did the second one, and became an advanced safe sex educator. Now, what did that entail? What did you have to do to earn those? Well, it was a whole week of, uh, of uh, panels and questions and breaking into small groups and talking about what was very similar to um, Swissy. Uh, which is panels and people talking about alternative sexuality or what it's like being straight in a queer world, um, what it's like being a gay in Colombia, because you're, and that was Spissy, because, not Spissy, but um, Sex uh, Institute, because you're going to talk to people, you're going to be with people, you're going to meet people who know nothing or who are deeply wounded. You don't know. I mean, gay, being gay in Colombia is not easy. But that obviously led you to working more with Cleo Dubois on the uh, SM intensives for women. Was that she and I um, worked out of my home, and she moved across the street. She worked mainly in the dungeon, which had been her bedroom. It's a seven-room flat, by the way. So, uh, and this, where I'm sitting, which is now my office, used to be the fantasy room. And so I would, I had the babies, I had the crossdressers, and I had slaves. She had the bondage and the SM, like that. I did bondage and SM too, but as you can see, I'm not wearing leather. 
I'm a leather woman, but that's not who I am at my core. Um, what, did this, what did you do with this information going forward? That's so difficult to really explain. It's not about me. It's about me being big enough for you to be all of who you are. The hidden parts. The parts that you don't know. The parts that you're ashamed of. The parts that you... What? The part that you've hidden for so long. That's what I teach. But it's simply about being a receptacle for you to be who you are, to show up fully. My job is to sit here and let you show up. What do you think has been your greatest accomplishment? You know, I've accomplished a lot. I met my person. We did great work together. Bill Hankin and I. I did a lot of personal healing from the abuse that I had. I wrote my book with Bill. What is that book? Consensual Sadomasochism, how to talk about it and how to do it safely. And to, I don't, I otherwise I'd show it up to you. Um, it's out of print now. You can find it on Amazon. Sometimes it's $100, sometimes it's 11 I'd recommend going for the 11 <laughs> I have. Um, <laughs> it's a good book. It's an SM 101 pr primer, really. Um, but those, my accomplishment is that I have had a fuck ton of fun. <laughs> After being bullied, you couldn't, you know, you can't keep a good kid down, I swear. Um, yeah, that's my accomplishment. That at 72, I can look back at my life and say, you healed from all of that, and not only that, you turned it around and, and turned it, everything into an asset, into a tool. Well, Sybil Holiday, I've got to thank you very much for what is going to be a fantastic interview when we're done. I appreciate it, and I hope I will speak with you soon. Well, me too. Ah, thank you. Yeah.